Welcome to the final video on the RNG manipulation. And this video is going to be all about the uh, mouse spawning algorithm. I'm going to make a tutorial after I've gone through a quick theoretical session. I know that the other two videos got kind of boring because there was too much theory. I'm going to keep it to a minimum, but there needs to be some kind of a backbone to understand what's going on behind the hood. So it's easier to find the bugs in case something goes wrong. Before I get started, I want to just mention quickly the other people that actually worked on the RNG research and the creation of this machine that you actually saw in the video. The main person that actually helped me the most was 202 name that helped me with uh, the code digging and actually designing of the RNG machine. Nessie helped with the actual building of the machine and survival and some parts of the RNG machine as well. Uh, Earth Computer was major help in discovering all the stuff and helped us throughout all of the different parts of the RNG stuff. And example was also there in the beginning of the RNG research. And I know that there is a bunch of people in Prototech that helped out as well, uh, indirectly through Earth. I, I never spoke to them, and they all uh, all were pro talking in private chat, in pro uh, Prototech private chat. But I guess their help came, out, came through Earth. Uh, I'll put their videos in the description, so you guys can go and check their stuff out as well, if you guys are interested. Earth Computer will also make a uh, video, uh, and he's tutorial series that he will explain his uh, special tool and other stuff that he will make tutorials on on RNG as well. So this is how the mob spawning algorithm works in code. I'm going to go through how this thing works and it's all based on one single gigantic method that is responsible for how um, mobs are chosen and where they're placed in the world. Now this is the theory behind the code that you just saw, and I'll go through it quickly because I know that a lot of people aren't interested in this part. I'll get to the tutorial as soon as, as fast as possible. Um, but here is the theory, and it starts where the players, the chunks that are chosen for the player around the player for mob spawning algorithm to work on. The first thing it does, it takes the player position and it, it chooses which chunk the player is standing inside of. Then it places the chunks in a list seven chunks in either direction, so a 15 by 15 area. A total of 225 chunks per player are placed inside of a hash list. And it's important why this is, um, what type of list this is. This is a hash list and I'll get to it later. But if a second player logs in, let's say another player logs in over here, and uh, this player is inside of a chunk, it won't place the chunks twice inside of the same chunk. These chunks are not placed in the, same, in the list twice they're uh, going to be placed only once inside of this list. So uh, generally speaking, two players will basically create the list of chunks, excluding the chunks that are, and the chunks that overlap uh, are only placed in a list once. The second thing the game does is to actually, to spawn in the monsters, then the, after it's done with the monsters, the animals, uh, after that is the ambient creatures and water creatures. It's generally easier to RNG manipulate the monsters because it's the first thing in the list. It's very difficult to control the animals, the farm animals, including the fact they only spawn in every 400 game ticks. It makes it almost useless. And ambient and war creatures are just completely trivial to RNG manipulate. So all the RNG manipulation that will be talked about in this video is in the monsters. And if you wanted to RNG manipulate farm animals, such as mushrooms and such, it is possible, but it's very difficult because after the game is done with monsters, the RNG seed is so scrambled that it's really difficult to be able to manipulate the farm animals. After the game have started to spawn in the mobs, it will start, as we discussed, spawn in the monsters first. It will actually place the chunks in the list in the first and the second and the third and so on and so on. And it will go, and we start on the second list here and then it will just keep on adding them in the list. But when you want to spawn in the mobs, the, cho the order of chunks that are actually chosen to spawn in the mobs is no longer in the same order that you place them into the list. The list order changes, so the first chunk that the, the game will attempt to spawn in mobs is located somewhere else. Let's assume that it's over here. And the second chunk is located over here and so on and so on. So this is a little bit complicated. I'll discuss this a little bit later. But before I get to it, I'll just um, explain how the uh, mob algorithm works. And this is something that people are probably familiar with if you have looked into the uh, game wiki. Uh, for those that haven't, I'll just go through it quickly and I'll explain how the this list is actually, um, how this how you can manipulate this using world RNG. The first thing the game does is to actually pick a chunk. This is like the first chunk. Um, just imagine this being the first chunk. The first thing it does is to choose a specific block to spawn in a mobs in. So 
looking at the chunk from above, like we are doing here. So looking at it from above, uh, it picks a block. Then based on this block, it will look for the highest block that blocks skylight. Uh, block skylight means that it reduces the skylight by any amount. Water, uh, glass doesn't block skylight, but blocks, whatever that reduces the skylight by even a small amount. That block will then determine the maximum height. The highest block is basically the one that is diffusing skylight. So assuming this column of this column that is represented here, I've redrawn it over here. Uh, there it doesn't matter how many blocks that are in this column that it's picked, it picks the highest block that is diffusing skylight. So there could be many blocks that diffuse skylight, but the highest block is chosen. And then it's going to take the span um, and pick any random block, let's say over here, to spawn in the mobs. Now, it's, it, if, you, if this block was lower, then the span of blocks would be smaller. Then it will pick another random location to spawn in the mobs in. So it depends where the location is based on subdivisions of 16. After the subdivision have been chosen, let's say that it chose this location, this height, at height 11 or whatever, it's going to pick uh, four spots in the same height, in the same height, in this plane. It's going to pick one, two, three, four uh, location to spawn in the mobs. And these four locations will always be the same if you're resetting the seed. And that's why you saw in a video where the mobs were coming out in the same spots all the time. So these four locations will always be the same and it will always be the same type of mob. And, all, uh, and the mob type will be based on the biome. So the biome will determine which type of mob will come out there uh, in this spot. So if you go to a different biome, different type of mobs will come out of the same locations. And, it, and then it will pick any mob count between one and four mobs. And then it will also do three pack spawning attempts. This is a bit too much information, but all the things that can be taken out of this is that the first chunk is chosen, the block of choice inside of the chunk is chosen, the elevation is chosen based on the highest uh, block that uh, block skylight, uh, and then it chooses an elevation based on this block, the highest block, and then it picks four locations to spawn in the mobs, and a specific mob type based on a biome. And one more interesting thing to note for those that are interested, there is one line of code that was added in 1.9, this line of code, and it's located inside of the mob algorithm right over here. And it's not using world rand, it's using some math.random, some random choice of line of code that was just completely randomly added into the game. And this one of line of code makes it impossible to control the mob algorithm past the first chunk. So if you're uh, trying to spawn in mobs in the first chunk and the second chunk and so on, makes it completely impossible because it's one line of code that was added in 1.9. Another thing that is kind of interesting to note is that this one line of code makes it impossible to control mobs if you're using the first chunk. If you block off the first chunk, you don't reach this line of code that scrambles everything. So if you place a block uh, where the first chunk is, this location, if you place a block there, a full block, it blocks off the first chunk and makes the game skip the first chunk and it moves on to the second chunk and starts mo uh, spawning mobs in the second chunk. And the interesting thing to take out of it is that if you're say getting witches to spawn in the first chunk, you might get creepers to spawn in the second chunk. And in the third chunk, you might get skeletons to spawn. So uh, you could get three different type of mobs by basically blocking off the primary block that the game chooses to spawn in the, in the mobs. Now this is the most complicated part of the mob spawning algorithm. I'll try to explain this. I've tried to explain it many times, uh, re-recorded it. Um, the game will actually attempt to, as we discussed, uh, spawn mobs in the first chunk and then the second chunk and so on and so on. And it's based on the X and Z hash locations. Uh, this gets a little bit technical for those that are not familiar with programming. I'll try to summarize it but the locations of the uh, chunks based on the X and Z hash and the hash order can also shuffle the locations around based on the hash size. And this is the location, this is the hash sizes 
and this is the number of players that can uh, that needs to be completely spread out to resize the hash and to scramble the locations. Now, for those that aren't technically minded, I'll try to simplify it. Uh, the locations of the uh, first chunk is can be used. You can use a tool to figure out the first location and a second location, and so on and so on. And these locations, the first chunk can change its position if the um, hash size or the number of players uh, attempting to spawn mobs into the world uh, are spread out enough and they will resize the hash and if the size of the hash expands it never shrinks until you reboot your server so since the last time the server has started the number of spread out players <coughs> can shuffle the first chunk around so the first chunk can move from here maybe it moves the second time to this location third time it moves to some other location and so on so and then the lo um, then this list over here shows the amount of players that can resize if they're spread out so the first resize happens at two players and the second happens at four and so on so uh, uh, the size of the hash can basically make it so that the chunk the first chunk is shuffling and it makes it more difficult to control where the mobs will come out um, uh, if you if you're attempting to spawn in mobs in the first chunk for example this basically means that if you want to make a platform you either need to figure out uh, all the locations where your mobs can come out based on how many players have logged in your into your server so if you only have uh, if you're in a player in a single player world you don't need to worry about this but if you're playing in a multiplayer world it means that if you're uh, having too many players on your server they can shift the position of the first chunk so you need to take that into account and you can also use a tool to figure out where the locations are and sometimes they don't actually the first chunk doesn't move around and you can use that into your advantage now this is the final video of the theory behind RNG manipulation. In the next video, I'm going to go through the tutorial and explanation of how the all this theoretical stuff can be applied in Minecraft instead of just a bunch of theory and on paper. So hopefully in the next video, you can actually get some practical stuff that actually can be applied in Minecraft directly. See you in the next video. Bye.